Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. I appreciate the opportunity you've afforded me to be able to bring a message from the Word of God to you this morning. But before I get into that, I just have a couple other notes, prayer requests, if you will. The first is for my good brother, Ben. Um, I know Ben wouldn't want this to be said, but too bad I get to speak. He has to sit there. But Ben has a shoulder problem. Um, I've had shoulder surgery, so I can relate. And every time I look over and I see the look on his face, I am so heartbroken for him. Because it only hurts as long as your arm is attached to your shoulder, um, which is all the time. And it's a pretty steady pain, but it's accented once in a while by a sharp dagger thrust anytime you move it a certain way. So please pray. He gets to have it looked at in uh, 11 days. So then maybe it's something they can do about it. So prayers for him, please. Also, prayers for Loretta. Loretta Pugh is also suffering from a pretty nasty head cold, and that's no fun. Hello, Loretta. Along those lines, you'll be moving the week of the 15th. I will sadly be sick the week of the 15th, so uh, prayers for me. Just kidding. Make sure you call. The new year. The new year is upon us. And, and new in our relationship with things that are new, and even just the word new, is a very interesting thing. The older you get, the word new loses much of shine. We tend to be creatures who don't like new things. We tend to be creatures who like a nice, steady rut to live in. Same thing day in and day out. No, I don't like that. You're wrong. Our lives are typified by ruts and the things that we don't want to change. And again, as you get older, change becomes a frightening word. And yet, at the same time, even though we tend to be creatures of habit, tend to fall into the same patterns over and over, the word new can be very exciting. Those of you who are old enough to remember... Um, I just lost it. The deal. Come on down. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. The Price is Right. Um, you remember during the showcase round, what was the most exciting thing to hear? And behind this curtain, a brand new car. Whew, everybody gets so excited. Oh, the young people, a new phone. Oh, exciting. A new computer. A new whatever. How exciting. Gene's dad got a, a new chainsaw, and I was talking to Jason about how incredible it is. So we've got this resistance to change, and yet we're all, to a degree, we, we, we enjoy that allure of the new. That's why the, the tradition of the celebration of the new year is such a, a good and almost a, a Christian idea. And what do I mean by that? It's not just the fact that, hey, we survived the plague and we're still alive. There is that degree historically to it. But there's also what we've attached to it of the New Year's resolutions, right? You know what? A new year is upon us, and next year I'm going to do X, Y, Z. Because I haven't been doing X, Y, Z, and I know I should, so I'm going to put it off till the new year, and then that's my resolution. And that's a very human thing too, isn't it? My favorite day to begin a new diet is tomorrow. Because tomorrow never comes, as Credence Clearwater Revival once sang. Well, no, someday never comes, excuse me. Um, because it's tomorrow, but with New Year's, it comes, right? So it's kind of a force to make you Make that change, and in general, that change is a bettering of yourself. Well, the great thing about Christianity is every minute of every day can be our new year, in that we are encouraged to not only be the new creations of God, as you see there up on the screen, but for every day to be pursuing a new and better you striving always for Christ's likeness, but always with the opportunity to put off the old and to do the new. 
This morning, I want to talk about this new year and the new you that can and should result. And we're going to consider it by considering God's plan for reconciliation, the new you in Christ, and then the new that you choose. I know, a lot of ooh sounds, but that's all right. God's plan for reconciliation. Brethren, let me give you a suggestion for the new year. Make it a tradition in your household, as we are making it in our household, to spend a time set apart every week to read the Bible aloud to the family. Gather your family together and read the Bible. Read it aloud and then talk about it. In 1 Peter chapter 4, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul wrote, Give attention to reading, is what the King James, New King James says. But most of the newer translations, ESV, NASB, NIV, um, say, Give attention to the public reading of Scripture. Uh, the New Living Translation said, give attention to reading the scripture aloud to the brethren. The reason is, there is power in this word. And when you read it aloud, you hear it better than you do in your voice. At least, I tend to be, Josh and I were talking a while ago, when I read, I'm a very fast reader. But the reason I'm a fast reader is, I skim certain parts. You know? Uh, I could read a Hemingway book in about five minutes because all that detail about setting and scenery, <sighs> I'm going to move on. Thank you very much. I just finished uh, um, The Sons Karamazov by uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, and he just chatters on and on and on and on. It was nightmarish. Um, but I finished, and it's all dialogue, and it seduced me into thinking something exciting is going to be said, but no, not so much. Read it aloud and with the family because I'm sure you've heard this. What's the best commentary on the Bible? The Bible. But here can be the problem. I read a chapter every night before I go to bed. Good on you. That's a good habit to get into. A rut, right? But here's the problem. Many of the authors, especially the Apostle Paul, makes his point across five chapters. So reading one chapter, you miss the fullness. Okay? That's my recommendation. Take advantage of it. Do what you will. But what we're going to do with our first point here is we're going to consider God's plan for reconciliation, dealing with man's sin problem, by considering Romans chapters 5 through 8. I don't have time to read it all. I wish I did. I'm going to read it the first one with my family because it is one of the most powerful discourses on everything that man has to know and to do. So we're going to look at two main things because that's all the time we have. The first is all the things that resulted from sin. Understand, sin is when we think, speak, act, in a way contrary to the will of God. We're going to consider all the things that were brought forth from our sin, from the old man. And then we're going to turn and look at all the things in those same chapters. Paul writes that we have received and have been brought forth by God in Christ. Okay? Everybody nods. I move forward. All the things that were brought forth by the old man, sin. Romans chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We earned wrath, the wrath of God. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Sin made us enemies. The old man had enmity between himself and God. And not only that, 
But we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, we earned death because of our sin, that old man. Therefore, Verse 18 of that same chapter. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. We earned judgment and the condemnation from that judgment, all from our sin, from that old man. Romans 6.21, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. That old man, what did he earn? He earned death and shame looking back upon it. Romans 7.24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I didn't highlight it because what is it? It is nothing but despair and hopelessness. That's what was brought forth by our sin, by the actions of the old man, the worldly, earthly man. Contrast that, because that's what Paul does in these chapters, with what we have, what's been brought forth in Christ. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, brethren, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice and we have hope of the glory of God. Verses 9 through 12, I already read it in the negative, but see the contrast with the positive. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from that wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled, no longer enemies, peace to God, through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Verses 17 through 21. Notice how Paul's always doing these contrasts back and forth. What happened and resulted from sin and what happened and what resulted from Christ. For if by the one man's offense, Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Through Adam, death reigned. Through Christ, Life reigns. And what did we receive? The gift of righteousness. The gift of right with Godness. Think of Genesis 15 and 6. Because of Abraham's faith, he was accounted righteous. So too we in Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, Adam, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's, Jesus' righteous act, the free gift, grace, came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's, Adam's, disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's, Christ's, obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The purpose of law for us is to help us to see that sin so that it becomes abundant. Thus we seek for a Savior. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more so that as sin reigned in death, that's in Adam, the old man, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 and verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with Christ through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There it is. 
Do you see it? The old man earned all those things, brought all those things upon himself. But through Christ, we have all these new things brought on to us, and we have a newness of life, not that oldness of sin. Verse 22 of that same chapter. But now, having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. Remember the negative that preceded that? It was shame. What fruit did you have then in the old man? Those things of which you are now ashamed. But the new man in Christ, we have holiness and everlasting life. Romans 7 and verse 6. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. We've been delivered from the law of Moses. Oh, so there's no law anymore? Of course that's not what he's saying. But what was the purpose of the law of Moses? We were told in Galatians 3, very powerfully, it was to convict you of sin. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I need a Savior. But in Christ, I'm now freed from the law. No longer under law, but under grace. Because I have my Savior. There's still law I have to find. But its purpose is not to condemn me. Its purpose is to maintain me. Verse, uh, oh, I read that, sorry. Chapter 7, verse 25. And in contrast to that, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? This is the answer. This is what we have through Christ. I thank God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we have thankfulness instead of that despair and hopelessness of verse 24. Romans 8, 14 through 17. And not only that, but as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. No longer servants like Israel. No longer servants like Abraham. No longer servants like Noah. Sons. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You're not under bondage of the law of Moses anymore. No, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. No, we were freed from that law and now we've been adopted as sons. And not only, not just sons, but that intimate relationship where we could say, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Wrap your mind around this, church. You are the heir of God. That means inheritance. And what must that inheritance be? How beautiful heaven must be. That's what that inheritance is. If indeed we suffer, we'll be joint heirs with Christ. That we may also be glorified with Christ. There's God's plan. All these things we had brought upon ourselves, that old man who was in sin and in service to sin. And then look at all the things brought forth by God through Christ and for those who are in Christ. Chapters eight, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, he gives us that big picture explanation of how exactly did God do that through Christ. There is therefore, church, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Why? Why is there now condemnation? I still sin sometimes. I haven't paid the price for my sin, because the wages of sin is death. I didn't do that. How can I not be condemned? For the law of the Spirit of life, in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. How? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Remember, this is what he talked about the whole chapter 7. The weakness of the law of Moses was not the law of Moses. It's not that the law of Moses was evil. The problem with the law of Moses was our inability to keep it perfectly. What the law of Moses could not do in that it was weak through us, God did. 
by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. We couldn't keep it perfectly, but God came in the flesh and he kept it perfectly. That was the purpose of the law, that it might be fulfilled in Christ. Well, what's the significance of fulfilling the law with Christ? So that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So that righteousness might be accounted to us because of what Christ did. That's reconciliation. That is salvation. As long as we walk according to the Spirit, not the flesh. The old man walked according to the flesh. The new man walks according to the Spirit. More on that later. That's God's plan. Well, what's the new you in Christ? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How are we a new creation? In Christ. Paul in Romans 5 through 8 explains that to us in great detail. I recommend it to you. How do we get into Christ? How do we become a new creation in Christ? Well, we're baptized into Christ. Romans 6, 3, Galatians 3, 27. And what is that? Well, it is a dying to self. Through baptism, we are connected to his death. As it said, we read, we are baptized into his death so that we have died. That is why later in chapter 6, well, so what? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Of course not. You died to sin. Well, shall we continue in sin since we're under grace and not under law? No. You're dead to sin. Well, how did I die? Through baptism and all that that is. Understanding the truth, understanding the need for my forgiveness, for the washing away of my sins, understanding by, that it's by the means of, of repenting and confessing, understanding that it's by means of the complete submission of our life so that we die to sin and to self, to live to God and to righteousness. That is the death that we have. Why? Why is the death so important? Because the dead are free from sin. Chapter 6. Let's say you have a pet that likes to get into your pies when you make pies. When that pet is dead, your pies are no longer trouble. Correct? That's the illustration of you are dead to sin. It is no longer a temptation to draw us away because we are a new creature. We have died to that old man that was slave, servant to sin. Now we are slave, servant to God. And while there still may be temptations out there, we are free from the sin and we are empowered to overcome in the future. Why? What did he say? When you die, you rise to newness of life. I'm now a new creature, born again. In John 3, we read that unless you were born again, you cannot see the kingdom. And I really think a better translation would have been born from above. And if you look at that word in the Greek, that's what it means. It means from above. Everyone here has been born of the flesh. Christians who are here have been born from above, from God. That born again that sometimes is so sadly abused in the denominational world, it is the truth. We have died in the waters of baptism to be born again. That new creation that is up there. And we are that new creation if we continue to walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. 
That's the new you in Christ. That's how you are free from sin. That is how you have that inheritance waiting for you. That's why you can sing and rejoice through life. Because that old man is dead and done away with. And that new man, the Christ-like man, pursuing him is renewed day by day. What about the new that you choose? The new year's upon us. You don't have to wait for tomorrow to make your choice. For the Christian, every second of every day is an opportunity for a new you. God's will is clearly revealed and is not changing. He wants you to be transformed and conformed to the image of His Son. Romans 8 and verse 29. From the beginning before the foundation of the earth, His plan was that we would all conform ourselves to the image of His Son. So there is a constant transformation. We sing that beautiful hymn, where it's less of me and more of he, on and on. That's the transformation. It's not a one and done. It's a one and done in that our sins, there's a baptistry behind her, that our sins are washed away, but then it's a day-by-day pursuit of Christ-likeness. That's God's will, that transformation. It's called sanctification in the Bible. But here's the gift of God. That's God's clearly revealed will, but the gift of God is the freedom to choose. God is love, and He loves us, and love does not force. He has told us. He has revealed everything we need to know, where we came from, who we are, His nature, His purpose for us, the situation within which we find ourselves. And He beckons to us through the love of His Son, to come to Him, to be washed and be made that new creation, His creation, in His Son, and to continue growing day by day until that glory, the glorification. But it's your choice. He will never take your choice away from you. He will never make you pursue Christ's likeness. The choice is yours. So as we sing, what will your answer be? Here's how we do it, church. Same author Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, 20-24, but you have not so learned Christ. We have to learn. If indeed you have heard Him and been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus, did you hear all that knowledge, all that information? It's all right here. As many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God that you should put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Remember all the stuff that old man brought upon himself? But instead, be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God, Christ's likeness, in true righteousness and holiness. You see how that's the same thing we read in Romans? What fruit do you have now? Holiness. What do you have now? Gift of righteousness. In Colossians 3.10, Paul put it this way. We have put on the new man who is renewed in, notice it, knowledge. According to the, notice the wording, image. Conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8.29. The image of him who created him. So what's this newness? How is it achieved? We look into this perfect mirror. And we examine ourselves. And we make our choice. Is this the man I'm going to strive to be? Is this the person I'm going to strive to be? And then pursue it. Bit by bit always transforming, never done, never complete, but always reading, because it's all about information. Have you so learned Christ? Well, yeah, I learned Christ in, in uh, Bible classes when I was young, and, and no, no you got to be constantly reading. 
because there's always more to grow. Constantly meditating. Assembling with the saints to help one another and receive help. Because sometimes we need a little, a gentle push or a nice kick. I can remember probably my third or fourth year into my first work in Jamestown, New York. Um, a brother came back who was attending the school of preaching, so they were all into it. And they, they made a statement in a, a pre-Bible class, Bible class we had with a group of men there. Um, and he mentioned something, and I went, I don't remember that at all. It was some thing in, you know, in the second Samuel, first king, second king. But you know what it was afterwards? I need to read that again. But no, at the school of preaching, I read everything and understood and got it all uh, put together. But I had forgotten that. I have to keep reading. We all have to keep reading. Keep seeing that image because the more you study, the more perfected that image becomes. The goal that we're reaching and striving for. And then we have to pursue it. The renewing of the spirit of your mind by the renewing of your knowledge. And then that enables you to do the hard work of not me, but he. Not my will, his will. Not the way I think I should react, as the old man would have reacted, but the way that he would have me react. In the manner, even, that he would have me react. That constant pursuit is salvation. That constant pursuit makes you the new creation. And that's salvation. I'll never forget, we had Brother Brad Harib come and speak to our congregation there up in Jamestown. And um, afterwards, he had talked about raising your kids and, and what, as grandparents, your responsibility is to your grandchildren uh, with regards to God. And, and one of a, a, a great man in our congregation raised his hand and he said, I have a question. My wife and I, we didn't do those things. We did many of those things, but we didn't do all of those things. What can we do now? Our kids don't live with us. Our grandkids aren't around us. And he made the point that's true. It's never too late. The influence, the leverage we have with individuals may change, but our ability to speak and to influence, especially those of our family, especially our precious grandchildren. That never stops as long as we don't let it stop. What do we do? We keep transforming. We keep pursuing the new man because that's salvation. As soon as we stop, we die. Pursue. Teach. Shine. Do all that you can. Therein lies salvation. If you've never put on Christ in baptism, that old man is who you are. That old man who grows corrupt in deceitful lusts. Think of all those things that were brought, but God brought Christ and all the blessings that are in Christ. Why deny yourself? Why not come this morning and be baptized into Christ Become a new creature with all those blessings. Christians, minute by minute, second by second, less of we and more of he, on and on and on. Never satisfied. Never too tired, too old, too weak to learn, to think, to try to be like Jesus. If you haven't been pursuing that, Change. Renew, as we see that word over and over. No matter how old, we can be brand new. If there's anything we can do to help you in this pursuit, we'd ask that you come as together we stand and sing.